Welcome to episode number 15 of Talking Mopars. On today's show, we are talking Hemis. This episode will be part one of a three-part series on the history of the Hemi, but don't worry. We're still going to talk Project Car of the Week, high-performance parts, and listener stories. Oh, and you're going to learn about a new way to get in touch with me and be part of the show. Don't go anywhere. You're tuned in to the best Mopar enthusiast-driven podcast on planet Earth, and I'm your host, Chris Albrecht, better known as the Mopar Hunter, and this is Talking Mopars. You're listening to Talking Mopars with the Mopar Hunter, your direct connection to all things Mopar. We are firing on all cylinders again this week, and we have a really fun episode today. The history of the Hemi is something that I feel that all Mopar enthusiasts should have a good common core knowledge of, and I hope this podcast can help you build up a good baseline knowledge of not only the Hemi, but of all things Mopar. And let me say this, when I say that Talking Mopars is your direct connection to all things Mopar, I mean what I say. I can't stress this enough. No Mopar will be left behind on this show. I want to cover as much Mopar history as I can, and we're going to do it, one episode at a time. Before we get into the Hemi, we have some regular show segments to cover first, but before we do, I want to remind you to send me your stories, questions, comments, complaints, suggestions, and so on to me at chris at talkingmoparts.com or by leaving me a voice message that I can share on the podcast at my new phone number, which is 209-28-MOPAR. That's, that's a new thing. I decided to get a phone number for voice messages because a lot of people have been emailing me questions and things like that. And I thought it would be fun if you had a way to leave me a voice message that I could actually share on this podcast. That's going to be fun. So anything that you would send me in an email, you can also send me as a voice message. Now, one thing I will say is I don't know how long these voice messages can be. So if you're going to send me a story, hopefully it's not too long. And if you get cut off, call again and start where you left off and I'll splice it together or something like that. We'll figure it out. But that's the number 20928 Mopar. Give me a call. Leave me a message and you will hear yourself on the show. And now let's get the show on the road. It's time once again for Project Car of the Week, but before we get into it, I have to say a little disclaimer. The ads for cars featured on Project Car of the Week have not been vetted. So, if you're interested in one of these cars, be sure to do your due diligence as you normally would with any car that you're considering buying. Okay, now that that's out of the way, this week's Project Car of the Week is a Challenger in Chehalis, Washington that was posted on the Mopar Hunter Facebook page on Monday, February 10th at 9 a.m. Let's read the ad. 1970 Dodge Challenger RTSE, 330 horsepower, 383 V8, console shift automatic factory slapstick, RT gauge cluster with tachometer and clock, air conditioning currently not working, power steering, remote operated chrome sport mirror driver side only, manual drum brakes, AM FM radio with three speaker dash currently not working but is original, 14 inch Dodge rally wheels with BF Goodrich tires, car does run and drive and has newer brakes and tires. This is an original, unrestored car. And as far as we know, this car is not just numbers matching, but has all the original major components such as engine, transmission, and rear axle. Even the license plates may be original. We have a repair order from 1976 that shows the same plate number that is currently licensed on the car. There were approximately 2,500 of these made and only available in 1970, the first year for the Dodge Challenger. Odometer shows 30,255 miles, and it is unknown for sure the mileage, but this has likely rolled over just one time given the condition of the car. This all adds up to a better than barn fine car that would make someone a great classic. Selling price thirty two thousand. Please email if interested. Okay, I really want to pick cheaper cars for Project Car of the Week, but cool ones that happen to be a little pricey keep coming up. <laughs> I think this Challenger is pretty cool. First of all, the seller claims that it is an original numbers matching car. Second, it's an RTSE. These are two neat things to consider when looking at the price and getting that all too familiar sticker shock that is so common with some of these more sought after Mopars. And with 2,500 or so of these RTSEs produced in 1970, this makes this particular car pretty special. I do wish it was a four-speed because that would definitely add to the coolness as well as value, but it's an automatic on the console rather than the column, so that's definitely a plus. Some folks may be turned off by the color combo. I'm not. As those of you who have been listening to this show know by now, I'm a fan of F8 Green. My Dart was originally triple green, and this car just happens to be triple green. It's got a green body, green top, and green guts. 
So for me, I really dig it. It has the cool rally gauge cluster, three speed wipers, woo woo, air conditioning, and overall, I think the condition is pretty good considering the car is 50 years old. It looks like it's held up well over time. It also runs, drives, and stops, and you know how I feel about Mopar projects that run, drive, and stop. Drive them, enjoy them. You know, maybe even if funds allow, restore them. Anything is better than them wasting away and not being enjoyed. And I'm sure there are those of you out there who believe the price tag of 32000 to be out of line. I respectfully disagree, and here's why. This is a great investment car. I think over time you could make a lot of money on this car should you ever decide to sell it. And what some folks fail to realize with some of these cars is that as time goes on and unrestored examples of these sought-after muscle cars get harder to find, that drives the prices up. And I've been hearing a lot of people say that the prices are actually coming down on Mopars based on the hammer prices at some of these auctions. While that may be the case when it comes to restored cars that are not, you know, factory original or correct like resto mods, I don't believe that to be the case when it comes to cars that retain a good percentage of their originality. I'm sure you've heard the saying, they are only original once. And I think you're going to see a huge surge in prices for cars like this. They are already getting out of reach for, you know, most of us average Joes with average bank accounts. And I think that trend is going to continue, especially as more of these cars enter the market because there is a limited supply of rare cars that retain a large percentage of their originality. So my advice is to get one before it's too late. You know, 32000 don't have the cash? Moonlight is a pizza delivery guy or an Uber driver. Get on that hustle and get you some muscle, baby. In conclusion, <laughs> if I had the cash, I would most certainly be interested in this car. Of course, I'd like the price to be more around 25000 but I do see the long-term value in it. I would also have no problem buying it at 32000 either. I think this car is great, and if it were mine, I would enjoy it as is, and... Slowly, I would obtain all the parts needed to make it period correct and try to bring it back to as close to original as possible. And I think it would be fun to nitpick the car and find every incorrect piece on it and then hunt the parts down if I owned it. But that's just because I personally enjoy the thrill of the hunt. You know, I love hunting the cars, the parts. Um, and you know what I'd actually do? I'd probably find some random things from that period of time that could be fun just to, you know, toss in the car at a car show to really give someone a glimpse of the past. You know, an old road map, maybe some old change on the floor, an issue of Hot Rod or Superstock Magazine on the back seat, maybe a can of some sort of, you know, beverage, adult or otherwise, an old pack of like Lucky Strike smokes. You know where I'm going with this. Come on, maybe toss on a set of vintage cheater slicks too, <laughs> you know? Um, I try to make it a fun, ratty vintage display that just oozes nostalgia. A lot of people tend to make a display around their car at car shows, I would actually want the car to be the display. I think it would be funny if people were like, man, he's leaving all this you know, trash in the car. And then they look a little bit closer and then they're like, oh, yeah, I used to smoke Lucky Strikes. I would want someone who got to experience that period of time to experience it once again when they look inside my car. That would be really cool. Then, of course, there are some of you who would rather just spend 30000 on a nice, unoriginal, driver-quality car. And that I also completely understand. This is just a difference in opinion, that's all. I personally love cars that have weird, nostalgic, and a ratty essence to them. They don't have to drive awful either. You can have a ratty-looking car that is mechanically perfect, and I think that would be awesome too. And that's kind of the direction I'd go with this car if it were mine. And to be honest, this car doesn't even look that ratty, so that's cool too. It's not one of those cars that is sun-baked and wearing lots of patina. It actually appears to be a car that was taken care of pretty well, considering it's 50 years old. So that concludes this week's installment of Project Car of the Week. Like I said at the beginning of this segment, you can see the car on my Facebook page, The Mopar Hunter, if you look at the 9 a.m. posting on February 10th. So go check it out. We are back for another installment of High Performance Parts. This segment is a new addition to the show, and it's about Mopars that have both big and small parts in film and television. If you're anything like me, you are always quick to point out Mopars in movies and on TV, and that's what this segment is all about. This week's high-performance part belongs to a car that was oddly both trashy and flashy. It was a car that most non-Mopar enthusiasts would simply think of as a POS upon first sight. It was everything it shouldn't have been. 
and it was driven by the character that a lot of us in the Mopar community have embraced. You may pronounce his name as Dierte, but most of us know him as Dirt, Joe Dirt. In the movie, Joe Dirt, played by David Spade, is a janitor with an epic mullet searching for his parents who he lost while visiting the Grand Canyon. The movie is basically one giant misadventure with mishaps every step of the way. Joe finally finds his way to L.A. where a radio shock jock brings him on his radio show to tell his story, and he quickly becomes a celebrity through the telling of his story. Here's where I could warn you of a spoiler alert and tell you what happens, but I think you can see for yourself by watching the movie. Funny enough, I can actually relate to Joe's habits with auto traders and obsession with Mopars. Um, The movie starts with Joe Dirt actually driving through the streets of Los Angeles in a dilapidated 69 Charger Daytona, which is the high-performance part of this week. It is the epitome of ratty muscle cars, if it was actually real, because the car used in the film was actually a Daytona clone dressed to look like the type of car one might find parked in front of a single white trailer that has plastic lawn furniture in the living room as home furnishings. (laughs) And to be honest, I absolutely love it. Shag seat covers, rusty, trash on the dash, barefoot gas pedal, chain steering wheel, 8-track, curb feelers, 8 balls and handcuffs hanging off the rear view, and with all that trashy flavor, I'm pretty sure this thing had a three-quarter racing cam in it too. (laughs) But the truth about the car is that when it was acquired, it was in decent driver condition, painted the world's most famous purple, FC7 Plum Crazy, and it was only dressed to appear as a complete pile. It's actually a rot-free car, and there's some pictures of it online that show the underside of it. The underside appears to be surprisingly solid. And in the movie, Joe buys this car from a shady impound lot for 450 bucks. But in real life, the car sold for, drumroll please, $18,000 back in 2002. That's actually, if you think about prices of chargers today, it's pretty cool that you could get a Joe Dirt movie car, because there was only one. They did not make a bunch of copies of it. There was only one Joe Dirt car, and it sold for eighteen grand. In today's market, 18000 doesn't get you much in the way of a Charger, let alone a movie car. So the car actually started life as a 318-powered Charger, but it's still cool nonetheless. You know, would you have bought this Mopar movie car for $18,000? I know the answer to the question for me, that it would be a resounding yes. And I'd be daily driving that dirt Daytona right now. If if that car was for sale right now for $18,000, I would buy it in a heartbeat. I wouldn't even be talking about it right now because I'd be going to get it. So <laughs> that's that. That's the high performance part for this week. It's Joe Dirt's 69 Charger Daytona. We're going to pretend that in the movie it's actually a real Daytona, but we all know the truth now. It was a clone. But 18000 bucks for a Joe Dirt movie car, that's awesome. This week's listener story comes to us all the way from Poland by a guy named Jacob Petrowski, a young man with a passion for Mopars. As a kid, I had a book describing the coolest cars in automotive history. My attention quickly turned on to muscle cars, especially Mopars. This led me to buy foreign magazines and later on two books, 50 Years of Mopar Muscle and Hemi, The Ultimate American V8. I have read them cover to cover. I think that those books had more influence on my English vocabulary than any textbook during my education. As a teen, I had quite big Mopar knowledge for a person that had never had any Mopar, not to mention a car. Even my mature exam presentation was about the movie Highwaymen just because of all the scenes with the Superstock 426 Barracuda, which is my dream car. In 2011, I got my first job on a car parts assembly line, Eaton Superchargers and Differentials to be specific. After the first few paychecks, I couldn't stand it and I bought my first Mopar. Cheapest possible with classic V8 and drivetrain, it was a very worn Dodge B250 1989 with a 318. My parents were mad. It was almost a copy of the situation Arnie Cunningham had in the Christine movie. Not 100% legally, but I finally registered the Dodge. It quickly became my mobile engine dyno and testing ground in the first steps of the hot rodding world. I sold my daily ride, a Suzuki Samurai, so I could buy performance parts, a carburetor to get rid of TBI, an intake manifold, exhaust long tubes, gauges, electric fan from the junkyard, and other add-ons in pursuit of horsepower. I painted it with spray cans to uniform black instead of the original two-tone. Effect was really badass, especially considering I had very little tools and the car was standing outside on my parents' precious driveway. 
After every modder fix, I made some test drives and still didn't trust it enough to go out of town. However, that was no obstacle to continue performance modifications. I didn't buy another daily driver, so I traveled to work by bicycle all year round, no matter frost, rain, snow. It was like that for many of the following years, so for quite a long time, I was literally Mopar or no car guy. I started taking every possible overtime and lived like a monk with no social life, no girlfriend, no beer. For the hard-earned money, I bought and installed myself a 2500 stall speed converter, shift kit, quite a hot camshaft, valve springs, and the biggest possible valves. At that time, I did my very first porting job. I grinded out so much iron, I think I was very lucky that I didn't break into the water jacket. After solving a whole series of problems, I made it and built the ultimate burnout machine. Very loud, high revving, and turning tires into clouds in a matter of seconds. I always got lots of attention at every car show. The interesting thing was that it always spun both tires, even though it had a stock, never opened eight and a quarter axle with 355 gears. Maybe there was some sawdust inside. I tried to compete in a quarter mile race. The results were miserable enough to not brag about them, despite the removal of about a thousand pounds of weight. So it was close to big block B body with a passenger. It turned out quickly that my laborer salaries were not enough to further my plans, so I changed workplaces. To one of the deadliest and well paid. As soon as I got a lucky contract, I bought another cheap Mopar, this time a classic one for cruising and keeping it mostly original. It is a white 1972 Dodge Polara four door 360 with the 727. One of the previous owners styled it like a Hazard County Sheriff's car, even though it's not correct. I guess it stayed many years in a dry garage because I found plenty of dried wasp nests. After redoing the carburetor, I also found the reason it stayed so long rod knock. All the valves and push rods were bent. Engine rebuild wasn't cost effective, so it was easier to get another 360. Luckily, my colleague just posted for sale his 360 with domed pistons. More souped up than I needed, but I could live with that. To make the Polara get back on the road even sooner, I hastily traded my muscle van, which turned out to be a tragic decision because I recouped only a quarter of the money I had into it. The Polara was still staying because of other issues. I started to drink a lot and smoke weed to forget the loss of the van. This year, I went back on the straight path and finished the Polara enough to run on its own power. On a gravel parking lot, no shelter, and with a trunk full of tools, I made it. I visited that place so often the owner was sick of watching me there. At last, this year autumn, I rented a normal garage that can fit American full size and all tools I have. I also bought a daily car so I can travel there because the garage is far from the city I live. This year I changed jobs again, and now I work in a restoration workshop doing vintage American muscle cars. Boss knows what I'm mostly skilled at, so usually I do the carburetors, heads, and everything Mopar related. For example... Now I've assembled a freshly powder-coated 67 Fury suspension, and soon I'll be rebuilding a 5.7 Hemi with the infamous valve seat problem. Now I'm poor again, but at least I do what I love, and I already have skills. Also, I'm in a very happy relationship with a woman I can marry, immigrate to the United States, start a company, and have lots of kids that I can raise to future Mopar lovers and automotive champions, or at least give them chances I never got. I'll be 30 years old soon, so I should be fast. Wish me luck. Jacob from Poland. Hey, Jacob, great story. And if you know my story, you know that I have a soft spot in my heart for Mopar vans. So I think it's very cool that you bought one and put so much effort into making it a cool Mopar that you could learn and have fun with. I am, of course, sad that you ended up trading it to get your Polara going, but it sounds like you have a pretty cool Polara now. So that's a positive that you can mine from the negative of letting go of your van. It was tough hearing about you falling into drinking and smoking weed to cope with the loss of your van, buddy. But I was happy to hear that you are back on the right path, and now you have a good-sized garage to work on your project. So, it's good to hear that you're following your passion with your work in a restoration shop, and I was also pleased to hear about your plans to raise a family and start a business here in the U.S. It's great that you want to start a Mopar family of your own, and that you have good goals. I wish you nothing but the best in your future, buddy. I also want to say that it's funny that you actually happen to mention the Barracuda from the movie Highwaymen, because... That car is on my list for the high-performance parts segment of this show, where I talk about Mopars used in films and television, so naturally, I guess that'll just have to be the next car we talk about um, on next week's segment. So thank you for sending in your story, Jacob. That's the listener story for this week, and if you want to hear your story on the show, email it to me at chris at talkingmopars.com, or call and leave me a message that I can share on the podcast by dialing my new number and leaving a message. The number is 209 28 Mopar. Its dominance changed the rules in racing. Its legend has withstood the test of time. Its name is synonymous with the word Mopar. It was the leader of the pack until it went dormant. Then it returned with a vengeance.
more technologically advanced but still carrying the essence of its high-performance heritage, the almighty Hemi. When it comes to the iconic elephant of an engine known as the Hemi, most people who fancy themselves car enthusiasts think of the 426 Hemi, or at least they had. With the recent developments in the world of modern engine performance, the Hemi has once again reclaimed the throne, which it relinquished so long ago. But its beginnings are sadly not widely known. The next time you see a modern Mopar with a Hemi, respectfully ask the owner if they know the heritage of what's under the hood. They probably won't be able to tell you. In fact, there are probably quite a bit of people in the Mopar community in general that don't know the complete story. Allow me to say here that the breakdown of Hemi history featured on this episode is going to focus on Chrysler Hemi V8s. If you actually dig into hemispherical combustion chambers used in engine design, you'll find that they were used as far back as the early 1900s and used long before Chrysler. Sorry, my fellow Mopar enthusiasts, but that's the truth. The other truth is that no one did it better back in the day than Chrysler and in the modern era, FCA. Before we get into this quick history lesson, though, let's talk real quick about what makes a hemispherical combustion chamber so special in the first place. Simply put, the hemispherical combustion chamber allows for a high compression ratio and a high volumetric efficiency. Combined with larger valves sitting opposite one another at a 58.5 degree separation within the combustion chamber and with the spark plug in the center between the intake and exhaust valves, cross flow from the intake to the exhaust is more efficient, creating a better squish bang, and blow. And what happens with better squish, bang, and blow? Mo power. It also helps that the design created a larger surface area promoting heat transfer and large cooling passages. So now that we have a better basic understanding of how it works, let's rewind the clock to the beginning when Chrysler first discovered the magic of hemispherical combustion chamber design. Technically, Chrysler realized the benefits of a hemispherical combustion chamber when they were testing them in aero and military applications. In fact, The first Chrysler engines with a Hemi were used in those applications, both in a tank and in a fighter plane. But this history lesson really begins in the late 40s. The knowledge Chrysler gained with the tank and fighter planes carried over into their automobiles. It wasn't until 1950 that all the research and development at the tune of about 8,000 hours of dyno testing and 500,000 plus miles of road testing for reliability paid off when Chrysler introduced the 331 cubic inch 5.4 liter 180 brake horsepower firepower for the 1951 model year, and officially the first overhead valve Hemi V8 in Chrysler history. Side note, the 1955 Chrysler C300 was rated at 300 bhp, utilizing dual Carter WCFB four-barrel carburetors rather than the typical two-barrel carburetors used in the other models. That car will most likely be featured on this podcast in an installment of high-performance heritage sometime in the future because it was so cool. Okay, back to our history lesson. The firepower spearheaded what would become known in Mopar history as the first generation Hemi. After the 331 came the 354 in 1956. Horsepower ratings for the 354 were 280, 340, and 355. At 300 bhp, the 354 became the first American V8 to be rated at 1 horsepower per cubic inch. It should be noted here that these cars were rated in bhp, which is brake horsepower. Brake horsepower does not account for power losses attributed to power-sucking components and accessories. It's just a measure of gross horsepower that was used prior to 1972. After that, power was measured in net horsepower at the crank, which accounted for those losses. Confused yet? Great. That's how we do it here at Talking Mopars because, you know, maybe pause the show here and go have a drink and gather your thoughts. Okay? Are you back? Good. Great. Moving on. In 1957 came the 392 with power ratings at 325 bhp, 345 bhp, 375 bhp, and a very, very rare 390 bhp offered in 1958 Chrysler 300Ds that had a Bendix Electrojector fuel injection system that suffered in the reliability department due to its primitive computer. Only one of the 16 cars built with the Electrojector system didn't get recalled and have a carburetor swapped in, so there's one out there that still has that electrojector. I'm going to do some research and see if I can dig up some information about the whereabouts of that car because I'm not quite sure where it is or what the story of it is. So I'll do a little bit of digging on that. But back to the lesson. DeSoto was also in the game in the early 50s, right alongside Chrysler. It was in 1952 that DeSoto released their version of Chrysler's Firepower, which they called the Firedome. 
The displacements of the fire dome were 276 cubic inches, rated at 160 bhp, 291 cubic inches, 330 cubic inches, 341 cubic inches, and finally the 345 cubic inch, rated at 345 bhp. Dodge also entered the Hemi game in 1953 when they released the Red Ram. It should be noted here that Dodge trucks were using the name Power Dome for their Hemis. Starting with a 140 bhp 241 cubic inch, followed by a 270 cubic inch with 183 bhp, and a super red ram version of the engine that utilized a four barrel carb to bump power up to 193 bhp. Then came the 315 cubic inch, which was available with polyspherical heads, with the exception being the high performance D500 engine that utilized a four barrel carb and a bigger valve Dodge Hemi head. Finally, the 325 cubic inch, which utilized a Hemi head only on the KD500 and the KD501, that also had the Hemi, but also was topped with dual four barrel carbs. There were several details within each of these years and sizes of engines between 1951 and 1958, and I would encourage any of you that want to look more into this first generation of Hemi to go out and do some research, learn more, because a book could be written with all the little intricacies of these engines, and I'm sure someone out there has already written one, so go try and find it and read it. I myself learned a ton when just fact-checking for this episode. Because, oh, oh, you thought I had all this memorized? <laughs> now, that's funny. I've said that I know a little bit about a lot, and that's the absolute truth. But one thing I love to do is learn about things that I'm passionate about, like Mopars. And I'm hoping that you will join me on this podcasting journey. And maybe we can teach each other some stuff. Because I sucked in school. But if there was a class on Mopars, I probably would have paid attention a little bit more. And I probably would have averaged a B or a B minus. I'm by no means an expert, but. I do my absolute best to provide you with accurate information, and I am not too proud to admit when I'm wrong. So if at any time you hear me state something wrong on this show, you know what number to call. 209-28-MOPAR. Leave me a message and school me, and I'll play your message on the show. Getting back to the Hemi history here. It's funny because I knew a little bit about the start of the Hemi, like the first generation. I knew a little bit of this stuff, but there's really, really a lot of information, and there was a lot of stuff that I learned um, just doing the research, and I did not realize that there were so many other companies before Chrysler that had actually used hemispherical combustion chambers. So it was really interesting to read more about that. I am thankful that Chrysler really did take the research that they had done on the tank and that fighter plane and adapted it to cars, because if they had never done that, we may not have the legendary Hemi that we know and love today. You know, could you imagine what NASCAR would have been and what drag racing history would have been without the Hemi? Ford and Chevy guys could have rejoiced because then they wouldn't have that kind of competition to deal with. (laughs) But I am so thankful that we have the Hemi today. That concludes the first generation of the Hemis. We still have two more generations of these marvelous wonders, but you're going to have to tune into part two of the history of the Hemi next week when we get into the most famous Hemi of Mopar legend and lore, the 426 cubic inch elephant. Now, you might be sitting there after having listened to the first generation Hemi story and thinking to yourself, man, he left out a lot of stuff. I understand where you're coming from. I did leave out a lot of the details surrounding the first generation Hemi, and it was more of an encouragement to get you to go out there and do some reading of your own, because chances are, I mean, I could have spouted off for two hours about this stuff, and you probably would have retained a a small percentage of it. So go out there and do some of your own learning. I'm just giving you the baseline knowledge. But Now, at least when somebody asks you about the first Hemi from Chrysler, you have a general idea and you have a good answer for them. So that's that. And that concludes this week's episode of Talking Mopars. For more information about this podcast or to listen and subscribe to the show, please visit TalkingMopars.com. Also, don't forget, you can send me your stories, questions, comments, complaints, suggestions, and everything else you can think of at Chris at TalkingMopars.com. Sharing the website with all of your Mopar-addicted friends is the best way 
to help me spread the word about this podcast or sharing it on social media, just letting people know about the show. You can also leave me a voice message now that I will share on the podcast, and my number is 209-28-MOPAR. So give me a call, leave a message, and I'll read it on the show. Until we talk again, I am your host, Chris Albrecht, and that was Talking Mopars. Thank you for listening to Talking Mopars, your direct connection to all things Mopar. Until next time, remember, no Mopar left behind.